In the previous video, we saw that light bends when it encounters a change in the medium and this phenomenon is called as refraction. But then, how much is this bending? How do we quantify it? What is it measure? What is it dependent upon? Let us try to find a pattern in this bending. Let's go back to our laser experiment. Let us look at the bending patterns that we observed. When we shine a light from above, the laser beam bends inwards. But if we shine it the opposite way, it bends outwards. Why do you think it happens this way? When going from a rarer medium like air into a denser medium like water, light bends inwards. While going from a denser medium to a rarer medium as in water to air, it bends outwards. Now, do you observe the same pattern when we have three layers, including the oil? Let us now quantify our observations regarding this bending of light. Let's call the incoming ray at the boundary of the media as the incident ray and the outgoing one as the refracted ray. Let us also look at the normal to the surface at the point where the ray enters the new medium. The first thing to observe here is that all these three, the incident ray, the refracted ray, and the normal are in the same plane. In fact, it is the first law of refraction. Let us now call the angles the incident and the refracted rays make with the normal as angle of incidence and angle of refraction. When light passes from a rarer medium into a denser medium, the angle of incidence is greater than the angle of refraction. This is the inward bending. Similarly, when going from a denser to a rarer medium, the angle of refraction is greater than the angle of incidence. This is the outward bending. Now, as we increase the angle of incidence, the angle of refraction also increases. Hmm, there must be some relation there. Let us try to figure it out. Let us now do the experiment described as activity three in the textbook. Keep a glass slab on a blank paper and draw its outline P, Q, R, S. Draw an inclined straight line on the side PQ so that it intersects PQ at N. Pierce two pins vertically at two points A and B along this line. Look at the pins A and B from the opposite side of the slab. And pierce pins C and D vertically so that the images of A and B are in line with the pins C and D. Now remove the slab and the pins and draw a straight line going through the point C and D so that it intersects SR at point M. Join points M and N. Now let us observe what is happening here. The incident ray is AN and the emergent ray is MD. Emergent ray is not quite along the incident ray, right? It seems to be shifted a bit. In fact, it is exactly parallel to the incident ray. How did this happen? The light ray inside the glass slab must have traveled along NM. So, at the first boundary, the incident ray AN bends inwards into the refracted ray Nm. This ray Nm again is incident on the other boundary where going from denser to a rarer medium it bends outwards into the emergent ray Md. Now we can measure here the angles of incidence and refraction. Let us first look at the first boundary. The angle made by the incident ray with the normal is the angle of incidence I, which in this case is 45 degrees. The angle made by the refracted ray with the normal is the angle of refraction R, which is 30 degrees here. Let us calculate the ratio of sin I with sin R. Here it is root 2. But why do we consider sin of I and R? Let us now try changing the angle of incidence and calculate the same ratio. Now, I and R are 60 degrees 
and 37.8 degrees respectively. The ratio of sin i is to sin r is root 2. Oh, it's the same ratio, right? Hmm. Let us try a few more angles. You will find that this ratio is the same for all of them. This in fact is the second law of refraction, which states that for a given pair of media, sin i upon sin r is a constant. This constant is called the refractive index. It is a property of a given pair of media. Have a look at the table given in the textbook for the absolute refractive indices of different substances. That is, refractive indices with respect to vacuum. This gives us an idea about the amount of bending. The more the refractive index, the more the light bends when it enters that medium. From the table in the textbook, look at substances having larger refractive indices. Which one has the largest? Diamond, right? <laughs> Can we understand any property of diamond from this? Maybe why is it so precious? Let us come back to this in a later video. But there is probably one question still ringing in your mind. Why does light bend at all when the medium changes? Can we understand this in a simpler way? Let us consider a group of students marching in a straight line like this. Their speed in walking while on stand is slower than compared to, say, grass. When they pass the boundary straight in this fashion, nothing special happens. They just slow down and keep walking in the same direction. But when they encounter the boundary in an inclined way, what happens? The students who enter the sand first slow down before the others at the far end have entered it. And what this ends up doing is that the students change direction and then keep going straight. In other words, they undergo bending. Hmm. Anything sounds similar to the bending of the ray of light? Indeed. The speed of light is different in different media, less in denser and more in rarer. This marching line of students is analogous to what is called the wave front of light. When it is incident in an inclined way onto a boundary, because of the different speed it has in the new medium, it indeed bends. Interesting, isn't it? So the amount of bending is also related to the speed of light in the two media v1 and v2. In fact, the refractive index, which is the measure of refraction, can also be related to these two speeds. It is the ratio of v1 and v2, the speed of light in the first medium divided by the speed of light in the second medium along the ray. 